welcome to a discussion with James McIntosh about transport and land use interactions. This is an important part of the assessment of any transport project, uh, but it has been growing in recent times into something that is a real tool. Now, I should go back to say that the Infrastructure Australia experience I had first four years of it, uh, a lot of work was done on assessing transport and we found that rail did a lot better than was previously thought um, because we included wider economic benefits and began to look at a little bit to do with the land value, but not really. It was very hard to say what how you incorporated land value factors. So I felt very uh, as, as though we, there was a lot more work to be done there. Um, and it was beyond me. It ne really needed modelers and people who knew the full economic story. And along came James McIntosh to do a PhD on just this. And then, um, then began to work with another PhD from our Institute Roman Trubka, and the two of them formed uh, Land Use Transport Interactions LUTI and have been working in this area since. So what we're going to hear about is the progress of this, how it has moved into being a, an almost standard tool that is now provided to help understand the value of public transport in, uh, in an urban system. So over to you, James. Thanks, Peter. It's good to see you again. Um, yeah, we we started this journey some years ago, back in 2011, when uh, I met Peter for the first time doing my PhD and, and Roman. So Lydia Consulting is um, Roman Trapka and myself, and we met doing our PhDs. And we, when we first started, we realised um, through dealing with Infrastructure Australia, through Peter, um, that there are a whole suite of things in the marketplace in land use and transport interactions and, and the benefits in the land markets that transport create that were not currently being captured at the time. So thanks to Peter and the PhD and the time, Roman and I got together and we learned a lot through that time and sort of subsequently decided to set up our business. And it's a really, interesting space to be in because it sort of falls in the crack between planning and uh, I suppose urban fabrics and governance around that and then transport and other economic factors. So it sits in this space which is, is arguably the reason why you do most of these projects to make urban and societal you know places better. So that's that's where we decided that we would we would form our part of the market. So really at, at, at its most fundamental, the interaction between land use and transport really is a, I suppose, a, an interaction between what is a, uh, I suppose, a modern urban form and its requirements and the transport system. Now, there are obviously a whole suite of other factors in there that um, are formative in why people move places other than transport and why businesses located in locations because of productivity reasons. But in broad, broad terms, modern cities' interactions with the transport network really do shape the way that they form and have formed over time. So part of the discussions um, that we have had over this time of setting our business up and working in this space is really understanding the application of economic theory into practice and working with Infrastructure Australia and other agencies like Infrastructure New South Wales and Assessment, we have grown and changed and transformed our business into the learnings that you naturally make in, in business that you, you, know, you, you realise that you did something once and that didn't work, so you go and try and do something differently and that works, so that evolves in, and businesses evolve and grow. So. That's a, a background to Roman and myself and what we do, but I'm not sure um, what level of detail we 
uh, expected to go into, but I have prepared a presentation and it'll take everyone through some examples on how the assessment framework and the modeling framework uh, works and how we respond to the needs of groups like Infrastructure Australia in the assessment framework. And I'll give some project examples and they kind of show or highlight how each one of the models addresses key parts of the need. So I'll go on to my, my first sort of main slide. And when we have a look at this, it really focuses on the modeling method uh, that we apply. And we apply it for a whole range of reasons. The main one, obviously, is that it addresses key criteria set out by different agencies, but probably most importantly, the, the modeling framework that we've provided, and there's sort of six steps on this slide, they address key parts of interaction, land market and transport uh, interaction modeling. So that's sort of the, the overarching framework. And what I've done is actually given uh, a series of example slides that come after this. And each one of these examples sort of shows some illustrations on how the, the modeling has been applied using some examples. Now, the examples don't relate to anything in particular, they're just examples of some of our modeling. So if we go to the modeling step one slide um, and has the example of, uh, of land market dependence. So we run the demand model um, and start to understand where the limits to growth are in these future years. So we we have a look, and if you have a look at the slide there on the left-hand side, there has a, a bunch of green lines on it. This is where the volume to capacity and some of the, the road network in this case, you know, that they, they have more vehicles on them than, than the roads can cope with. And it forms a really good basis of understanding then which travel zones are using those, um, uh, those discrete links or nodes, and then that forms like a basis of dependence. So this over over and above or any growth over and above what is forecast at this time really is unsupportable by the transport network at that time. And it, what it does is it, it tells us an area of influence that a future project is going to have. So our area that we're looking at in this case sort of fans to the north and it shows a whole bunch of, of travel zones that are using these, these links in the network that are um, over capacity and that forms our study area. And that's really useful to show both um, agencies and assessment agencies who are looking to say, well, what's the area of influence of your project? And there's no point forecasting growth in areas that your project doesn't influence. So turning around, for instance, if you're doing work uh, in Fremantle where Peter is, and then saying, well, we're gonna, we're gonna forecast some growth in response to a, a project in Fremantle in Scarborough or, or somewhere else. Well, that doesn't make any sense. So it has to have a nexus back to the investment and that's what this says. The next slide really focuses then on the interaction modeling and the demand responses for both in both the population and employment markets in response to the project. And like I said, different investments create different spatial delineations and different levels of growth. So in this case, this example shows this fan up to the north and there are key areas, the darker areas on there show higher levels of demand and the, the lighter areas are, are less so within the study area. And the population response on the left-hand side, you see very strong population response to the northern, northern part in there. And it highlights quite clearly when you start to have a look at it that some parts of the study area, there will be huge amounts of demand and in other, other areas, less so. And it pivots off what's there. So this is, this is another key attribute is that there is a set of forecasts that are there and it says, okay, what is the change in, in uh, demand in these areas based on what's already there? So there'll be an increased growth rate. So it changes the growth rates in these areas. And then on the right-hand side, you can see the employment. So you can see that there's a key employment node in the center there that is getting a, a benefit from this. So we use that as our, I suppose, our central forecast um, of demand response to the project. And then when you go into the next slide, you can see there's sort of a description here about how we apply the development capacity, because we need to, as I mentioned before, you, you need to limit your analysis to the supportable capacity of the investment. Light rail, for instance, 
is a really good market integra integrator in corridors. It moves more people than a bus, but less than a heavy rail. Um, its service frequency, its speed will change the amount of uh, development that it can support over and above what's already there. The next slide really focuses on, on the growth redistribution. So what we can see in this, this example is that the green within our little red study area there, we have forecast growth um, in these key areas. And these are areas that can grow, are supportable by the transport network, and probably most importantly, respond to the accessibility changes that the project delivers. And there are areas um, in the surrounding areas, but some of the outer lying areas in, in this example, where the growth in these areas probably you know, requires a transport investment in future years. So we're creating a more accessible part of town. So we're gonna to move some of the population and employment growth in there. And these are just examples, and they're more illustrative than anything else, just to show how the model works. But really what we're doing is we're changing the nature of the way cities grow. We're not bulldozing anyone's house or shop or anything and saying, okay, you're in an inaccessible part of town, we're gonna to move you. It's really about how regions grow over time and that growth rate or that percent, you know, portion of growth that, that happens um, can be redistributed into areas that are more spatially efficient. The next slide really does start to get to the heart of a lot of the interaction modeling, because what we've then done is we do a series of calibrations on the network to start to understand. On the left-hand side, we have the link volume to capacity analysis. And it, what it does is it shows are our transport investments, are they, they're obviously creating benefits, but if we go through and we put excessive growth in, in areas, so if we turn around and say for a light rail and we go and say, oh, 40 story towers up and down the corridor and they go, well, the transport mode can't actually move that many people and you're actually stuck creating traffic chaos at the road network. We need to back off some of the forecasts. So it's calibrating the um, growth in these areas to the specific um, transport mode and the way that the network performs. So you don't go and put growth in there in areas that then clog up the, all the existing road network and everything else. Second part is we go and have a look at intersections and basically have a look and see whether or not we're creating undue delay at key intersections across the network. It's a similar in concept to task one, but it has a different focus. We then start to have a look at about the regional accessibility or the effective job density or access to employment. And we're making sure that we're not creating any areas of growth um, in our region that are becoming less accessible over time. And then we start to map some of the economic benefits of the project and making sure we're not creating disbenefits um, in response to that. And again, these pictures are just illustrative of how the modeling process works, but it is quite uh, clear when we start to have a look at it. The project's creating benefits. It's not creating too many problems in our area. And probably most importantly, the calibration phase that we're, not, that we're conducting doesn't really, um, isn't creating more problems than it's fixing. So then we start to go into the economic benefits and I'm not, I'm not really gonna to focus too much on uh, the economic appraisal itself because you know, that's reasonably well documented around the place about what you can do. But I'll give some ex examples on how, when you start doing ex post analysis of how projects actually perform, you actually start to understand how the markets respond. And this is useful for both your forecasting, but it's also useful for the narrative for the project on how price responses will relate um, in response to the project. And our hedonic price model, you can go through um, and have a look on our website. You can download a whole series of papers on there that we've written about it and other things like that. But the, the examples that I give here are applying what are called time series um, hedonic price models to different projects across Australia. And Peter's key focus of the discussion was really on surface transport. So I focused our analysis on the, the key surface projects that we've looked at over time. So when you have a look at these slides, so there's about five project examples of some of the economic impacts of the projects. What we're doing is we're looking at um, three light rail and a couple of bus projects and how land market price 
shows land market demand for the accessibility. And and this is ex post. So this is how this is materialized in the markets over time. So the first one we'll look at is the inner west light rail in Sydney. And it was the extension uh, basically from Roselle down to Double Chill. And a lot of um, public transport projects in particular, it's the proximity to the infrastructure. So people get an access premium for living near the, in this case, the light rail. So they, if they live there, then they can use it. And if you're further away from it, you can't. So people want to live there. They have an increased willingness to pay. And what we can see with um, the first example that we have here is that the project was announced in about 2010. It opened in 2014. And by 2014, 2015, and there's a bit of a lag in some of the analysis, the change in government assessed land value in response to the project is about 10%. So a 10% shift in land value in response to the light rail project in the forward amenity catchment. And that's just the monetization of accessibility because we've controlled the zoning, we've controlled for other things as well. So what that shows is basically is 10% shift for people wanting to move to these areas. There's a price response, that price response changes the bill form and, and other factors. But this can be used as part of the, um, the value capture analysis as well, that if you do want to come in and put in um, some sort of alternative funding package in response to the changes in, in land market value, then this is good evidence base for doing that. The next slide is the Southeast Light Rail. So basically this is where it goes down to Kingswood um, and to Randwick and, uh, the, sorry, Kingsford, not Kingswood and back into the city. And again, it looks in the sort of the surrounding pink study area the, as a comparative area, what the what the land market response or land value response is within the walking catchments compared to the areas that are not getting the benefit that are too far away. And again, it shows about a 10% uplift from the, the time of announcement or around that time up to the commencement of operations. And it's important um, to understand that in a lot of these corridors, um, and I would say broadly for all of them, the there hasn't been massive policy shifts in a lot of these markets to enable a lot of land use change. So this project, the uh, Southeast Light Rail, they, um, the, there was a proponent or a proposal from government at the time when the project was put forward that there would be a rezoning on the corridor and the councils said no, that they didn't want it that and they would conduct their own processes. So they did, the councils, Randwick Council ran their own um, public engagement, engaged some architects and others to go through and do that. And it was called the K2K plan or the Kensington uh, to Kingsford uh, plan, basically is a, a city shaping strategy. And that came out, I think in late 19, 2019, early 2020, and that's sort of set to realise some of the benefits that are created by the project. The next project example is from analysis that we did on the Gold Coast when we were working on Gold Coast Light Rail. And what it shows here is there's about a 25% uplift to stage one of the project. And the initial years, there was response to GFC for the region and everything else that was in there. And it was really tough on key parts of the corridor. So the, the blue line on the top, the 400 meter catchment. Um, investments in light rail in particular, very tough on the, the 400 meter catchment or the area around there because it's very disruptive. You, know, you wind up digging up half the roads and the, the utility networks at the time trying to reshape. Now it's magnificent and wonderful once it's built, but yeah, it's pretty tough at the time, but you do see a pretty significant response. And um, I didn't actually have any of our later data to hand, but yeah, the, the benefits keep going up. So the uplift from project announcement to the, um, you know, to what's happening there now is about 25%. And it's, it's a really good example in, in this case of investment in the light rather than a dense urban corridor and how demand has responded there. And the next two projects that I'll talk about are bus based projects and both of them are excellent transport projects move a lot of people and they're really highly utilized and 
do amazing things for the parts of Sydney that they, um, they operate. But if we go on to the slide that talks about the B line, so the B line is the double decker bus line that basically goes from the city, crosses the bridge, goes along Military Road, and then up into the northern beaches up to Motorvale. And this is an incredibly important transport mode for the region and highly used. But what we do see is, is that there really isn't, hasn't been a land market response to the project. And interestingly, um, half the stations on the corridor or thereabouts, I can't remember exactly how many there were, but a significant number of them had park and ride. And when you put park and ride next to any transport network, be it rail station or whatever else, it means you don't have to live anywhere near it. You can live 10 k's away and still have the same transport accessibility because you can just drive to the parking lot. So what you do see with the light rail projects we showed previously, um, they focus specifically on uh, walking access primarily, but when you put park and ride, it sort of dilutes the land market response to being a sub-regional response rather than a proximity-based response. And really in the the land market catchments around the stations um, up and down that corridor whilst it's an incredibly well used line and a really important part of the transport network to be frank because trying to fit any other sort of transport up in there would be unbelievably hard really there hasn't been much of a response and particularly the park and ride stations there's just noise no one really cares about you know cares about living near them so i suppose the take home there is is that this is sort of a line haul BRT line. Um, and in this case, there hasn't been a land market response. And again, it doesn't mean that it's not a great project and it doesn't mean that it doesn't have an important part of the transport network function, but the land market response has been negligible. The next one is the Parramatta to Liverpool T-Way. And this has been in operation for a, a long time. So it opened in 2003. And what you can see really in all the catchments, the 400, 800 and 1600 meter catchments, it's the, the mode really hasn't done very much, if anything, and it's just really noise. So our model basically shows is that, that along those corridors, response to the project, it, there hasn't been a discernible response or a clear response to the project in terms of a land market response. Again, unbelievably important part of the transport network, very highly utilized and is a good project in that it solves a key part of the transport network and the, the and the, the Parramatta, both Parramatta is growing unbelievably as is Liverpool as well and the connection between the two is really important. But what we do see with bus based modes is that in general, they are more of a, they have more of a transport function rather than a city shopping function. So they solve transport mode issues and, and need and demand but they don't tend to shape the city in terms of change in price, letting a change in feasibility and a change in bill form. And it's, a, it's an important part of the discussion because when you look at transport projects, um, you really need to look at the objectives. Why are you doing it? If it's solving a, uh, an unbelievably important transport problem that exists, then arguably the objective is transport. If you want to facilitate growth in an area or you want to facilitate an urban change around a new transport mode, then it's probably more of a city shaping project. And that's where you start to see the, you know, the movement and place aspects of different projects that some are movement based projects or, or basically transport projects and some are city shaping or, or more place oriented projects. So Peter, that, that sort of concludes my diatribe. So apologies for talking for too long, but um, happy to answer any questions. Great stuff. Thank you, James. And um, yes, I do see that uh, journey that you've been on uh, and being quite productive. Um, your final comments about city shaping are very relevant to what we're doing. We are very interested in city shaping. Um, in many ways, our Metronet uh, rail systems in Perth have been about transport only and not city shaping. They are reaching out to corridors that don't have much and have a lot of park and ride. Um, 
but getting to them along those main roads, the connections, uh, what we're interested in showing could be areas of city shaping. They can be urban regeneration projects along there. So very important not to have park and ride around those sort of stations. And uh, that's a key conclusion I would make in general from what you've said. You got a comment on that? Yeah, I mean, it, park and ride forms a really important part of the access mode to to stations, you know, rail stations, because um, not everyone can live near it next to the station. If you look at the ones in WA, they 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 create this huge level of accessibility, particularly in the south, where you see people driving significant distances every day to get the park and ride, and 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 it gets them off, you know, the Mitchell and Kornana freeways, which is fantastic. So. You get a really good strong transport function, but it it really disperses and to a certain extent dilutes the key um, city shaping or, or you know positive um, attributes that transport can bring to you know reshape a city into a more dense urban form. Yeah, and the uh, other lines have less of that high speed kind of. Uh, high capacity uh, approach and they are more traditional rail lines and there is more redevelopment happening around them. Uh, you should see Claremont now since uh, you've left our oh, um, and those kind of uh, processes are ones that we're trying to facilitate um, and it's the same in the other cities as well. There are opportunities, I think, along this, these new metro lines um, that are going in in Sydney and, and in, in Melbourne. Um, so Absolutely. it is a, a, a way of balancing all that out uh, and seeing what is important for transport, what's important for city shaping. Uh, how do we get more redevelopment back into the city so that people don't have to travel 20 kilometres in order to get to a, a train station at Mandurah, which is already another 80 kilometres to drive to, uh, to, to get to the city. Uh, so um, uh, that, that, that's a bigger question, I suppose, but uh, your model helps to understand that process. Yeah, it, look, it does. And, and I think you raised a really important thing. Um, the metros in Sydney, we've worked on most of them at, in different parts for different different purposes. And, you know, Metro Northwest, when it's fully, you know, at its full operational capacity, um, and COVID's been a disruptor in that space, no end. But when it's fully operational, it moves 45,000 people an hour, which is unbelievable, really, for one train line to move 45,000 people an hour, and it connects up you know, the whole sort of global economic corridor there. But what it what it does do is the supportable capacity for that region. It will enable an enormous people amount of people to shape, uh, sorry, change modes, but it will also enable a huge amount of development around these areas. And as the city grows, and Sydney grows, you know, at 100,000 people per year pre-COVID, and as it grows, more people who move to Sydney will move into these more transport accessible areas because of housing availability. There'll be apartments and other townhouses and other things nearby them, but they will be, they'll have a, a transport premium that they will be, you know, minutes or, or you know, tens of minutes or half an hour or, or even more quicker to get to the, their, their employment at all these employment centres along the corridor than if you had to drive. So there's a real market premium for people wanting to move to these areas and there's a real market premium for developers and others to uh, to move there and and actually start realising some of these opportunities. But at the same time, there is a big role for government as well to communicate a lot of these, these benefits, show how the demand response will be really really important for the society, even for those who don't, aren't that keen on density, that if you create these opportunities by creating places that are more accessible, people will want to move there. 
Mm. And not everything, not everywhere has to look like the Gold Coast, by the way. You know, you can have different levels of accessibility, creating different levels of different built form and that are bespoke to the area. So you know, not everything has to be high rises, but more accessible areas will drive more people to want to move to them. And even the areas where you see a lack of willingness to go through and rezone and make them more dense, the demands there, you know, the councils are getting hit with development applications every five minutes and you can only say no for so long before they have to start to give in. So the demand will drive the change, but it won't be an optimised scenario unless, you know, the governments get behind, you know, in an ordered fashion, having the conversation like they did in Randwick. The, the K2K plan was excellent because it was a bottom-up fed thing from through council with a urban design team and everything else, and they actually came up with their own city shaping strategy, which ironically isn't that isn't that different to what the state had proposed to start off with which is kind of ironic anyway but it it, it highlights that there was significant demand there's a significant opportunity and now provides certainty to the development market of what they want and it ranges i think between sort of 20 25 stories um which is pretty dense for that part of sydney but before their plan was put in place they were getting applications for 35 stories up and down Anzac Parade, um, which they didn't want and the community didn't want, but the developers are like, demand is there, demand, demand. So now the market has certainty around what they can do. And I think that's been a big lesson for everyone. Very good. And I think that that's what you are providing in this model is a greater certainty for the decision makers that what they're putting in can produce urban outcomes as well as transport outcomes. And that's a major breakthrough for me to be able to see that and to see that it is possible to do city shaping as well as providing a transport opportunity. And in fact, that they're totally integrated. So um, hopefully you'll be able to keep doing more of this work uh, and that uh, uh, it, it will be a global thing because what you are doing is is basically reinventing the role of of public transport anyway as a as a city shaping device uh, that is helping us overcome the car dependence that we thought was going to be the only thing that we had in our future and it's really put it to rest uh, as the only option and that cities can now choose a better way. Uh, which I think is a major breakthrough. So congratulations. Yeah. Hopefully you'll have a lot more work to uh, keep things going. Um, so thanks, James. Thanks, Peter. And yeah, thanks to, to you and our time that Roman had with you. And um, yeah, it's, it's an exciting time to be, to, to be working in this space.